Amen. So here we are in Acts chapter 19. So Paul is in, um, Paul is in Ephesus at this point, and Paul is actually um, on his third, if you look at um, verse number 23 of chapter um, 18, um, Paul's actually, you know, he stopped in Antioch, and then he just, he just left right away, and he went up into Asia, and he's been going all around um, Asia, um, confirming the disciples as he does. So he's actually on his third missionary um, journey. I didn't really point it out um, at this time because of the fact that really you're starting to see a pattern here that Paul's life is kind of a missionary journey. The missionary journeys of Paul are kind of, um, you know, they're kind of just defined as he stops in Antioch. <laughs> and he's just kind of going around constantly um, on a missionary journey. And the third one is actually a little bit less harder to define. He stays in Ephesus quite a while. And then it, it, there's a lot of generalities about where he went. But since Acts chapter 18, verse 23, um, he has been on his, what, what is known as his third missionary journey. Um, we're going to start in verse number 8 of Acts chapter 19. Of course, we looked at these um, men that he saw um, in, um, in Ephesus. He's, been in, he's in Ephesus um, so far, and he's going to be in Ephesus for you know, a couple years here. And he met these men that didn't know anything about the Holy Spirit, talked about the baptism of John um, last week. Looked at some things there. But look at this um, next um, situation that comes up. Very interesting situation. Very applicable to us today and things that we will see um, in, in the past, things that we will see in the future. Um, just a common thing that happens all the time. But a super interesting point in the Bible here. Look at verse number 8. Definitely a reason that we're given this story in the Bible tonight. Look at verse number 8. It says, And he went into the synagogue, this is Paul, and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. So he's in there, he's preaching the gospel um, to the Jews in the synagogues. But when divers were hardened and believed not, meaning when the people, you know, started to believe, you know, they, they just weren't accepting it. It says, but spake evil of that way before the multitude. He departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. And this continued by the space of two years, so that all they that dwelled in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. So like I said, pretty much Paul's whole life um, is a missionary journey here. He's on his third one. He's spending um, years in Ephesus here. Must have been pretty fruitful for him to stay there um, for so long. Um, but, you know, yeah, we could all say that our lives are a missionary journey, I guess, just to, just to make a little point there. Um, but look at verse number 11. Not only was he preaching the gospel, but he was also... Um, performing miracles as we've seen the disciples do in the book of Acts. Look at verse 11. It says, And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. Notice that God did the miracles just through Paul's hands. So it was God that was the one that was doing the healing or whatever these miracles were. Look at verse number 12. So that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Then certain vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. So this is interesting here. So first of all, in verse number 12 and verse number 13, let me point out this, this two words that we see here, evil spirits. All right. So we see there's these evil spirits. Now there's two types of of evil spirits in the Bible, all right? In the Old Testament, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 16. There's an evil spirit that is talked about in the Old Testament, um, particularly concerning King Saul, and I want to point out the difference between that evil spirit and the evil spirit that we're talking about in the New Testament here. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 16. Look at verse number 14. In the New Testament, these evil spirits, and I'll prove this to you um, from the Bible, these evil spirits that we're talking about in Acts chapter 19 are literally demons. They're literally um, entities. They're literally, um, you know, they're, they're demons. They're, they're angels of Satan, basically, that are possessing uh, people. But in the Old Testament, look at 1 Samuel chapter 16, look at verse 14. The Bible says this, But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. So when it comes to Saul and this evil spirit, you will always see these words that follow this evil spirit um, after the words evil spirit, and it says it's an evil spirit from the Lord. This is not a demon from the Lord. Okay, this is a, the, the word evil here is, is, means it's a troubling spirit. It's a, it's a punishing spirit. Basically, God is chastising Saul, and this is a, it's more of a, 
You know, this is the equivalent when it says the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. That's the equivalent of saying that he was no longer filled with the Spirit. Okay, so this is, you know, the filling of the Holy Spirit that they had in Acts chapter 2. This is how you could be filled with the Holy Spirit when you go out and you preach boldly the gospel to somebody. Many times you will definitely feel like you are filled with the Spirit when you are doing that. And that is a real thing that really happens, okay? And that's what it's talking about here. It doesn't say Saul lost his salvation. It's just saying he's no longer filled with the Spirit. Same thing happened to Samson. We know that Samson is saved. And, you know, the Bible says, you know, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Samson. This is the Old Testament equivalent of being filled with the Holy Spirit and, you know, basically grieving, you know, God is what Saul was doing, and he was under God's chastisement. So God troubled his spirit. God gave him a troubled spirit. And if you read the story of Saul, you will basically, it reads like he's going crazy. If you read the story of Saul, in these chapters, there's a lot of detail on King Saul in the Bible. He's chasing David. He's trying to kill his own son. It literally reads like he's losing his mind. And look, that is a real thing, this troubling spirit from the Lord. You can see that with Christians that are being chastised today. I mean, if you've seen backslidden Christians who are just, you know, being chastised today, many times, you know, Christians that are still in the spirit and in the word will look at somebody who's backslidden and just, you know, fighting against God, and they'll be, you'll, you'll look at them and you'll be like, it's like you've lost your mind. But that's what this is, okay? It's the same thing that we're seeing in the Old Testament. All that to say this, Saul wasn't possessed with an evil spirit. He wasn't possessed with a demon, like we're talking about in the New Testament. When the New Testament is talking about evil spirits, it's talking about literal demons of Satan, okay? And I'll prove that to you. Let's go back to Acts chapter 19. So just to get our definitions Right, so basically, this, this man, um, there were certain vagabond Jews, exorcists, it says, took upon them to call over them, which had evil spirits. So there's some people um, that had evil spirits in the name, and they were just like, they were just using the name of Jesus here, saying, we adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preacheth. It wasn't Jesus that they believed in. They were just, just name-dropping Jesus to try to get some, some action going here with this, these demon-possessed people. Look at verse 14. It gets more detail here, and it says, there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and chief of the priests, which did so. So there was these Jews that, that these seven Jews, vagabond Jews, maybe they were traveling Jews or whatever that meant, um, and they were, they were claiming to be exorcists, and they saw that Paul was doing all these miracles. In, in what name was Paul doing the miracles? In the name of Jesus, he was doing the miracles, and they're like, hey, we're going to try that. Now look at this. Now this proves to you this is an actual entity here. This is an actual individual. This is an actual, I guess you could say, you know, personhood of, of some kind. In verse 15, it says, and the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? So there's your proof right there that this is an actual entity with a personality. Okay, this is an actual demon here. Look, you never see this with Saul. You never see this with Saul. Saul just, Saul's just losing his mind. He's just going crazy. He's mad. He's angry. He's depressed. You know, that's that troubling spirit from the Lord. He was under the chastisement of God. Very similar to, you know, what happened to Nebuchadnezzar in, in the Bible. All right? Look at that, verse number 16 of Acts chapter 19. So here we, what's the story? We have Paul. He's doing all these miracles in Ephesus. He's healing the sick. He's casting out evil spirits. He's doing all these great miracles in the name of Jesus. So you have these unbelieving Jews, they're just like, hey, we're exorcists, let's try this, right? It seems to be working. Look at verse 16. And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them. So here's a person, a literal human being that was possessed. Look, possession is real, by the way, too. And if you're saved long enough and you're a soul winner long enough, you will run into people that are possessed. You will see people that are possessed with a devil, with an evil spirit, all right? That's a real thing, and it happens today. But this man, the man that's possessed by the demon, he leaps on them and overcame them and prevailed against them. So they fled out of the house naked and wounded. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus. And fear fell on all of them, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men, and they counted the prices of them and found 50,000 pieces of silver. All that to say that a great lesson was learned here, and people started giving up these dark arts and all these things 
regardless of how much money they had invested into it, is what that's trying to get at in verse number 19. But I'm going to stop there. I'm going to stop there, and I want to talk about some of the things. I want to talk about these men, these, these seven men, what they were doing and why they were doing it and why we will still see that happen today. And then I want to talk about what this demon also said. Okay? So look, these men, they were exorcists. They were, you know, they were performing witchcraft or whatever they were doing. I'm sure they were doing this for, as a business, for money. <clears throat> and they saw Paul doing these great things, and they're like, hey, this is a method. Let's try this, is what they did. So they just tried to use the name of Jesus to, you know, they just said, hey, we adjure you by this Jesus guy that Paul talks about, is what they said. All right? Obviously, it didn't work out like they thought it was going to work out. But look, they saw it work for Paul, and they just started name-dropping Jesus, is what they started doing. All right? So why this name? Why do people name-drop Jesus? First of all, I'm going to give you three levels of Jesus name-droppers today. All right? And then you kind of picture who that you could imagine that is these types of people. But look, you're going to see name droppers today that use the name of Jesus to accomplish things for them. All of these name droppers are what the Bible would call false prophets. All right? Every single one of them. But I'm going to start with the least serious. Turn to Matthew chapter 15. Turn to Matthew chapter 15. I'm going to start with the least serious, you know, Jesus name droppers and move to the more serious, the most serious Jesus name droppers. I kind of got it cut up into three levels. And this is just kind of how I think about um, these, you know, groups of people, because there's lots of different levels of people that drop the name of Jesus just for their own, you know, benefit, for their own. We'll talk about the reasons in, in a few minutes. But look at Matthew chapter 15. Here's the, here's the least serious. They're all serious, okay? They're all what we'd call false prophets. But here's the, the least dangerous, maybe, is what you could look at. Look at Matthew chapter 15, and look at verse number Eight. The Bible says this, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Here's verse number nine. But in vain they do worship me, teaching, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. The Jesus social workers are the, are the first level of, of false prophet or Jesus name droppers, really. They're teaching for commandments, the doctrines of men, and they're using the name of Jesus to do it. These are the, these are the self-help gurus that use Jesus. All right, these are, the, these are the, you know, I guess you could put Joel Osteen in this category a little bit. He's a little bit more serious. But these are the people that just want to be out there, and they just want to be given advice, and they just want to, you know, they really don't have, you know, any, they don't know any doctrine in the Bible. They don't really have any interest. This is your, this is your liberal Christian pastor today. Right? This, they don't have any doctrine on their website. You can't figure out what they believe because they don't believe anything. They just, have, they just believe the commandments of men. They just believe whatever the world believes, but they just drop Jesus' name in there. They just drop Jesus in there, and they teach this philosophy, this, this worldly philosophy of the fake Jesus. You know, this is the church sign that I drive by every day that says, love all, serve all. You know, what does that mean? You know, I mean, how could... That's, that's a ridiculous statement. Love all, serve all. That Jesus, they teach this fake Jesus that, you know, would never, would never judge anyone. You know, they, it's, it's always attached to a false gospel, if there is a gospel. But this is the, you know, maybe there's no gospel at all, is the thing. You know, this is the, the church, you go to their website, and there's no belief statement. You can't find out any doctrine that they believe. You can't find out what gospel they believe. And, and as a matter of fact, if you would actually talk to those pastors, which I have many, many, many times, and I'm using the, the term pastor tonight loosely, all right, if you would talk to those pastors, they really don't care. They really don't care what you believe. Anybody in their church could believe or teach anything. That, this is the, the Jesus social worker right here. All right? And look, the person, the person that goes to this church is going to be the person that goes to this church, and you're going to knock on their door. They're going to have no clue how to get to heaven. You're going to tell them how to get to heaven, maybe even get them saved. Then you're going to be like, doesn't that bother you that you go to a church that has no interest in telling you how to get to heaven? And they're going to be like, huh, 
is they go to a, just this feel good, you know, motivational session, basically, every, every Sunday morning that drops the name of Jesus. Okay, but look, they're teaching the commandments of men. They're not even, they're not even really twisting doctrine, which is what, you know, we're going to talk about next. They're just name dropping Jesus to just further some social agenda that the pastor has. You know, just to be an advice guru, basically. To be this feel good, you know, you're the best Jesus in there. You know, that's what they're doing. And they just throw his name in the mix. Now, this is the lightest version of the false prophet right here. The lightest version. Look, it's, it's still serious. I mean, it's a false prophet all the same. Now, I've been asked the question many times, you know, do you think there, there could be a sincere false prophet out there? A false prophet out there that's, that's just sincere and just doesn't know he's wrong. And the answer I would tell you is, yes, I do believe that. Why do I believe that? Because Paul was that. Paul was a sincere false prophet. But here's what I do believe. Here's what I do believe. And you soul winners, you tell me if I'm wrong on this. Here's what I do believe. I believe if, I'm a humble, if there's a humble, sincere false prophet, he will get saved. That's what I believe. Or she will get saved. All right? I believe if there's a humble, sincere false prophet, look, because look, Jesus said, seek and ye shall find. If you want to know the truth, you know, God will show you the truth, especially somebody like that. And that's why, you know, God went after Paul. Because Paul obviously was ready to receive the truth. He was ready to receive it. All right, but here's the thing. Most of these, even these light versions of false prophets that just have no doctrine, they're just all about some social gospel of whatever their particular social gospel is. There's no doctrine. There's no anything. It's just beliefs mean nothing to them. It's just, here's the thing. Most of them are very prideful people. Most of them are very prideful people. And you soul winners tell me if I'm wrong. You know, you knock on the door of some, you know, female pastor that is like this, knows no doctrine, knows zero Bible, knows nothing about what the Word of God actually says, but is a very prideful person, usually. Very hard to talk to people like that. You knock on the door of, of some deacon of a church or something like this, or somebody who's, whose uncle is a deacon or mother is a deacon or whatever. They're always, they're always very prideful people. And this is a major problem. And there will be consequences you know, for those people. Right? So look, yeah, there, there could be, I believe that there's sincere false prophets. Paul was a sincere false prophet. But I believe if they're sincere and they're humble, they will end up getting out of that and getting saved. Okay? So if you find yourself a prideful, even lighter version of this, you know, social gospel, you know, false prophet, it, it's still something that's, that's very serious. All right? Now, look, we're going to kind of ratchet this up a little bit. We're talking about Jesus name droppers here. We're talking about false prophets. It's like these seven people were, were doing. They were just using the name of Jesus to further some agenda that they had. But I want you to notice a trend as we get more serious here. Just I want you to recognize how much more serious and how much more harmful these people become to folks around them and to the world itself. All right, here's the next one. These are the, what I call the Jesus messengers. Okay, the Jesus messengers. These are people who claim to be teaching Jesus' message. They claim to be teaching the Bible. They're taking doctrine and they're twisting the doctrine. Okay, the very simplest version of this is your, you know, your Pentecostals, your Protestants that just have a twisted works-based gospel. All right, they're taking the Bible, they're using it, and they're twisting it. A more serious version of these people are people that claim extra revelation from Jesus. Now we get into people like the Catholics. The Catholics that claim, you know, the Pope is the vicar of Christ and that, you know, his, his revelation and his doctrine, you know, can override the Bible. And that's where they get things like purgatory. That's where they get things like how you can, you know, pay for indulgences to get your your relatives out of hell or purgatory or whatever they make up at the time. That's how they make up so many different doctrines that aren't anywhere near the Bible. They have all this extra revelation through this extra biblical, you know, figurehead that they put, you know, in their church, okay? And look, you say, is it more dangerous? Well, yeah, the Catholic Church has murdered millions of Christians, literally. It's murdered millions of Christians. I mean, for things like what? 
So when you're getting extra revelation, you certainly don't want people reading the Bible. You certainly don't want people having a Bible. So that's what they're after people for. They burn villages. They've killed thousands of people for just having Bibles. You know, once the Bible started being written down, especially in English, you know, it was just, it was an all-out war against getting the Bible out of people's hands. Because if you're teaching things contrary to the Bible and you know that, you can't have people reading it. All right? So you see, it's dangerous. The Jehovah's Witnesses, another one. Extra revelation. Extra biblical revelation. One of my favorite Jehovah Witness extra biblical revelations is, the, is in California. It's the, it's the Beth, Sira, Beth, Beth Serum mansion in San Diego. There was a mansion built in 1920, late 20s, late 1920s, by the head of the Jehovah's Witnesses church. And he said, we have to build this mansion because... Abraham and Isaac and Jacob are coming back. So we have to build this huge mansion in San Diego. So when they come back, and he's like, I'll live in it until they get here. <laughs> you know, I mean, you gotta look at some of this stuff and you're just like, how do people go along with this stuff? But no, this is real. You can like tour this place today. It went into private ownership, I don't know, 50 years ago, but you could actually take it. I'm not gonna say I'm gonna take a tour of the devil house. But the point is, I mean, that's a pretty good one. I mean, it's like you can get people to follow that. You know, I mean, you know, I mean, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they dwelt in tents, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11. I mean, they, dwe they dwelt in tabernacles. You know, they, they don't need a mansion, but no, uh, you know, whatever. They also predicted the end of the world like in uh, 1878, 1881, 1914, 1918. I think 1970s sometime they predicted that the second coming of Christ, not the end of the world, sorry. But, you know, they're wrong every time. And it's like, they're still, they're still at it, you know? So turn to Deuteronomy chapter 18. You know, so all this extra biblical revelation, like this isn't anything new. But this is a more serious version of, you know, somebody that's just name-dropping Jesus. These people are not just name-dropping Jesus like these exorcists were. They're actually saying, hey, Jesus told me extra stuff that he didn't tell you. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 18. So how can we... How can we, how, how, I'm not even going to say how can we. I'm going to say how should people, you know, hold, what, what kind of light should people shine on this? Look at Deuteronomy chapter 18. The Bible is very clear. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse number 18. It's not that hard to figure out who the false prophets are, folks. Look at, especially when they're, when they're I mean, it's really easy to figure them out when they're like declaring the second coming of Christ and then it doesn't happen. Like, eight times. <laughs> you know what I mean? Look at Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18. The Bible says, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, and I will put my words in his mouth. This is God speaking, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. So the question is, God saying, hey, I'm going to give you a prophet, and he's going to speak my words to you. The question would become, how do we know, God, if this prophet is really speaking your words? And the Bible tells us this answer. Look at verse number 19. It shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I'll require it of him. But the prophet, which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. If thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? Like, how are we going to know if he's telling us the truth, God? Look at verse 22. When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. So what it's saying is like, if somebody's coming and making all these, you know, end of the world predictions, any kind of prophecy to you, and it doesn't come true, false prophet. That's what the Bible is saying. God's saying, that's how you can tell. He's like, then I didn't tell him. All right, I mean, the Seventh-day Adventists are the same. I mean, the Seventh-day Adventists sparked, they came out of, I, I did a whole thing on this. I, I, they, they came out of the Millerite movement in the mid-1840s, I think. And the Millerite, the Millerite guy, like, he, he was some Methodist, and then he predicted the end of the, the second coming of Christ, same thing, it didn't happen. And then Ellen G. White's like, oh, it didn't happen because I just had all these visions to explain, you know, why it didn't happen. And she's a huge false prophet. There's so many prophecies that she made that never came true. Like, you can't, even, you can't even begin to, and what does she have? False gospel. You know, what does she have? There's no hell. 
you know, there's just like false gospel, works-based salvation, but eat healthy food. I mean, it's just like, you know, it's just like how are people following this if they just knew what the Bible said? Like, hey, people make prophecies and they don't come true. That, that's not of God, all right? Now we start to get a little bit more serious, but still talking about extra revelation, you got the Mormons. You got the Mormons, you know, the extra revelation. They literally, the, well, the Book of Mormon is literally called another testament of Jesus Christ. I mean, Joseph Smith basically said, like, look, Jesus just told me all this extra stuff that he never told you. So it's, it's extra revelation. Joseph Smith actually borders on the last category that I'm going to talk about tonight. He never claimed to be Jesus, but he said that he was better than Jesus, actually. And it makes sense because the Mormons actually believe that you can become equivalent to Jesus. They believe that you can become a son of God just like Jesus. You can have your own planet just like Jesus, all this other stuff, right? So that brings me to the last category. And by the way, Deuteronomy chapter 13 talks about um, it, it basically covers false prophets. We won't go there, but it covers false prophets when it talks about, well, what if they do do great signs and wonders? Well, Deuteronomy chapter 13 says, hey, if a, a prophet comes to you and does great signs and wonders, imagine Deuteronomy chapter 13 saying this, saying if a prophet comes to you and does great signs and wonders, but he tells you to go after other gods, G, lowercase g-o-d, s, it's like, that's, that prophet shall die. You know, that's a false prophet, is what Deuteronomy chapter 13 teaches. It's almost like, you know, the whole book, word of God was written before one word was written. Because Revelation chapter 13, that is exactly what the, the false prophet of the Antichrist is going to do. He's going to do great signs and wonders. He's going to do great signs and wonders. He's going to raise up this image and say, hey, worship it. And we're like, hey, no, Deuteronomy chapter 13. You wonder, like, how Christians are going to recognize all this. It's like, because it's right there in the Bible. Very simple direction. All right, so we got the Book of Mormon, another testament of Jesus Christ. So we got these next people, you know, the, the, the second category that I was just talking about are people that just take God's doctrine and they twist it. They use it for themselves. They claim that they got extra revelation, you know, from the Lord. The last category is this. The last category, these are special people right here. These are people, that they don't just name drop Jesus. They claim to be Jesus. Turn to Matthew chapter 24. Turn to Matthew chapter 24. And look, there's too many people to list, even today. Even today, that literally claim to be Jesus. There's literally hundreds, yea, I'm sure thousands of people since Jesus walked this earth that have claimed to be Jesus. Many of them are alive today. You know, if you look up, if you look up, you know, people that claim to be Jesus in each century, you'll find dozens and dozens and dozens of names of people that claim to be Jesus. Look at Matthew 24, look at verse number 4. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. As he doesn't say they're going to come in my name saying we want to exercise demons. He's saying, look, there's going to be people that come in my name literally saying that I, they're, they're me, Jesus says, and shall deceive many, <laughs> and people will follow them. Scores of people throughout history have done this. You know, some names. All, all, and look, and many times, many times, these people are seriously dangerous people. The people that actually claim to be the Son of God. Sun Young Moon, Sun, Sun Young Moon died in 2012. You know, went to hell in 2012. Yep. He was the, you know, he was the, the Unification Church, um, you know, leader that claimed to be Jesus. Jim Jones, I don't know, maybe you younger people don't remember. Jim Jones was this big, you know, he was the founder of the People's Temple. He's the one that took people and just like he claimed to be the reincarnated Jesus. And he took all these people, and, and like they all like committed suicide together. You know, I mean, here's another uh, great one: Charles Manson. Like a literally, I mean, you want to talk about demon possessed? I mean, Charles Manson, you know, had to have been demon possessed. I mean, I never actually like met the guy, but I mean, like, the guy is just a murderous psychopath. David Koresh, I don't know if you remember that story: the Branch Davidians from the early '90s or the the mid '90s. You know, Bill Clinton took care of him. That's another story in itself. But the point is, like, there's been, there's many people still alive today that
that claim to be Jesus. And look, many of these people, of the, of the names I just read you, many of these people are very, very dangerous people. The people that follow them, many of them ended up dying. Many of them end, ended up going to prison for murdering people. You know, there's many other names of people that claim to be Jesus even alive today that are they're just murderers and they're in prison because they're, they're just like, they just go out and they just start murdering people. So it's like demon possession and this, you know, are definitely tied together. This week, it's funny, I was writing, I was reading and writing this sermon, and then this week, there's some, I'm not even going to mention the name, but there's some famous flat earther pastor that now claims to be Jesus. Like, for real. Like, straight up, like, I'm the son of God, I'm Jesus. And like, this one's unique, because he's not the second coming, he's like, no, I'm the first coming of Jesus. Like, that's, I mean, that's, that's an extra bold one, right there. Now, I'm, you know, I've never really addressed, like, the flat earth thing, you know, like, from the pulpit, but you know, here's the thing, like, I don't think being a flat earther, like, makes it so you can't get saved, but, like, if you are a flat earther, like, there's major issues there, you know, for these flat earth people. I didn't even know it was a thing until I moved to California, but it's a real thing. And here, look, talk about conspiracies. I believe that it actually is a conspiracy, the flat earth thing, like, for real now. I'm being serious, and I think this is true, okay? I believe the flat earth, I believe the flat earth groups and people and all this because look it's not moderated on it's not taken off of youtube it's not taken off of anywhere they just these flat earth people they just run rampant everywhere i mean all over the place this flat earth stuff is all over the place i believe that it's actually there it, it's it's there to discredit to discredit actual conspiracies it's it's there to be this this over the top you know conspiracy thing that just looks completely crazy to make anybody who has any kind of conspiracy theory look like a nutcase. So, I mean, I believe that the flat earth thing is actually a tool of Satan to, to discredit people that are seeking truth out there. And look, I, I mean, I, I believe that it's working because, you know, the, I mean, the flat earth thing is, is completely, it's, it's bonkers. Like I said, I'm not saying you can't be saved if you're a flat earther, but I'm telling you, I mean, just personally as a pastor, I don't think I'd want a flat earther in, in church. I mean, because there's just going to be so many other problems that come along with that. Unless, of course, you can, you know, sit down with them with a globe and, you know, spin it around a few times and, and maybe convince them. But, you know, I mean, look, you, you know I'm not even against conspiracy theories. But, you know, for, you know, for crying out loud, your conspiracy guide should be, you know, question everything, you know, but not the Bible. <laughs> you know, don't question the Bible, all right? Get off at that salvation stop, you know, get off at that, that salvation bus, bus stop there and realize, you know, hey, you know, all the other stuff is, is, is kind of like noise, right? I mean, we love to talk about stuff in this church, but at the end of the day, you know, we all know that it doesn't, the only thing that matters is the Bible. The only thing that matters is the Word of God, and we don't doubt that here, all right? So look, back to this, back to this Jesus name-dropping situation. We've got these three levels. That's kind of just the, the levels. They're just kind of the way I've always thought about it, you know? But, you know, you think about it, you think about it, it's really kind of a cult playbook, right? I mean, you kind of got a, a playbook of anybody that is using the name of Jesus, I believe, is what I classify as a cult. I mean, if you're using the name of Jesus and you're falsifying it, you're forging it, you're not, you're not teaching what Jesus taught, you're just using his name for your own, you know, benefit and your own vanity and your own whatever, you know, I, I believe that that is a cult right there. And look, all of these cults follow the same thing. They predict the end of the world, and then, you know, if they get really crazy, they, they say that they're the Messiah. They say that they're Jesus himself. All right, go back to Acts. Go back to Acts. So why do people do it? All right, why do people do it? Like, I just wanted to show you, though, that there's no new thing under the sun. Okay, there's no new thing under the sun. We're going to keep seeing this happen until the end is here. All right, in Philippians chapter 2, look at verse number 9. Turn to Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 9. Just keep your place in Acts chapter 19. You know, what is it about? Why do people do it now? We see, you know, that people do it on varying levels. Why do they do it? Why do they do it? Look at Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 9. See, it's all about this name. It's all about Jesus' name. Look at Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 9. The Bible says, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the sun, and that every tongue should confess 
that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There's no other name that, can, that even claims that. There's no other name that claims that every single person will, every single person in heaven and earth will bow to this what? This name. There's no other name that, that, that claims that. Go back to Acts chapter 4. Go back to Acts chapter 4. Go back to Acts chapter 4 and look at verse number 10. Now the guys, the disciples, were, were using Jesus' name the whole time in the book of Acts. Look at verse number 10 of Acts chapter 4. Why this name is the question. Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God hath raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand here before you whole. He just healed somebody and he's saying, look, you know, it's by Jesus' name that this man was healed. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. And then look at verse number 12. So verse number 12, it says, Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So up in verse number 10, the name heals. This is what the guys in Acts chapter 19 were trying to use it for. Because they saw Paul with this name that was healing all these people. They're like, hey, we can use that. Give me that wrench. And they're trying to heal with it. And in verse number 12, we see that it's the only name that saves. So it heals. It saves. Philippians chapter 2 says that it's so powerful that literally every single person in heaven and earth will bow to it. It's powerful. It heals. It saves. That, it saves. That's why people use it. That's why people forge it. Acts chapter 3, verse 6, Peter says, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I give to thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. So they're always saying in the name of Jesus Christ. So many people today use the name of Jesus for these reasons. Power and control. That's why. That's it. The Catholics, the Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, all the false prophets, all these Christian cults, it's all, of, look, that's why they do it, for power and control. That's it. Over people. They use the name of Jesus. Influence. Money. Just, you know, control over people. Control over their wives. Control over their families. I mean, just, I mean, with the extremes that we talked about tonight, with the extremes from the, from the light false prophet that just believes nothing, but is just preaching some social gospel, dropping Jesus' name in there, to the wicked, evil, many times demon-possessed person that is claiming to be Jesus Christ himself. With those extremes of people, wicked people out there, using Jesus' names, it is so stupid for people today to believe that anyone claiming the name of Jesus is saved. Yeah, isn't that what people think today? That, oh, it, it, the church has a cross on it? No. Look at all the categories of people that we use. Look at these people in Acts chapter 19. They were just dropping Jesus' name. Who, it, the Bible doesn't even... Who would even pretend that these people and these seven men were, were, were believing on Jesus? Nobody. They were just... And the demon knew it. This demon knew better than many Christians today. Think about that. The demon himself knew better. Look, even politicians use Jesus' name for power. Every Republican presidential candidate since I have been this tall has got a name drop Jesus. Why? We got to get that evangelical vote. So what do they do? What do they do? They they gotta they gotta they gotta they gotta say the name of Jesus a couple times in a in a speech or an interview or something, and then they're good. And all the evangelicals are like, oh, he said Jesus. This demon knew better. The demon knew better. California has used the name of Jesus, the words of Jesus, to justify murdering millions of unborn babies. They have put Jesus' words on billboards. 
to try to justify murder. This demon knew better than this. Look, folks, it takes more than name dropping to be saved. Turn to Matthew chapter 7. Turn to Matthew chapter 7. Turn to Matthew chapter 7 and look at verse 22. The Bible says in Matthew 7, verse 22, it says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, they're going to drop his name right at his feet, some of these people. Have we not prophesied in thy name? Doesn't this sound, make a little bit more sense now? Of course you prophesied in my name. Jesus is, I mean, lots of people prophesied in the name of Jesus. In thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then Jesus says this, he says, and then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Just like he didn't know these seven men, he's going to say, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Name dropping is not going to work with Jesus. Just, I mean, just like the demon, Jesus is going to say to those people, who are you? Even the demons are smarter than the ecumenical Christians today. There might even be ecumenical saved Christians that believe this garbage. That anybody that drops the name of Jesus is saved. Name dropping may work with men, but not standing before Jesus. So we talked about the name droppers. I want to talk about two things about the demon now. Let's talk about the demon. We talked about the seven men and the name droppers. Name dropping Jesus is something you're going to see for the rest of your life on this earth. You're going to see it from the light social gospel to the extreme demon-possessed nutcase who literally claims to be Jesus. Right? There's nothing new under the sun. There's two things I want to point out about the demon, though. Go back to Acts chapter 19. Go back to Acts chapter 19. There's two things I want you to take away from this demon. The first thing is this. Keep your place in Acts 19, keep a finger there, and you're going to go to Mark chapter 1. We're going to go to Mark chapter 1. The first thing is this. The demon knew Jesus. Turn to Mark chapter 1. But guess what, folks? Being saved is about believing on or trusting Jesus, not just knowing who he is. Look at Mark chapter 1, verse 23. We see another example of this. The Bible says, And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. Same thing. Evil spirit. Demon here. And he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? Look, they knew who he was. They were afraid of him. I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. They knew who Jesus was. They knew he was the, the Messiah. And they knew he was God. But is this demon saved? No, because you must trust on Jesus. You must, that's what believe on means. Knowing that he's the Messiah, knowing that he's the Son of God, knowing that he is God is not good enough. You must trust in him. Even the demons know who Jesus is. In James 2.19, it says, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. That's what we see in Mark chapter 1. But they don't believe on him. They don't trust on him. Okay, so first of all, the first point I want to make is this about the demon is he knew Jesus. The demons always know Jesus. And this demon knew Jesus. In Acts chapter 19, verse 15, he said, Jesus I know. But look at this. Look at the next part of this verse where he says, and Paul I know. That's where it gets a little, you know, a little hairs on the back of your head. You should start standing up now. Because the second point about the demon is d the demon knows who Jesus is. But the second point is this. The demon knew who was saved. So the demon knew Jesus and the demon, I mean, look, isn't, isn't, that, isn't that kind of an amazing thing? It tells you that the demon is a spiritual being. Do you really know who's saved? I say that many times to people. You know, like, I, I can't see your heart. You know, only God can see your heart. But the demon knew who was saved. So the demon knows. Satan knows who is saved on this earth. 
Satan is a spiritual being, and he knows who the saved are. And look, this is very real here, and you need to understand this. He knows who the people that are preaching the real Jesus are. Satan knows this. I, I've said this to many of you, you know, many times that as you grow in your Christian life, I mean, please remember this. You should please be aware of this. You should always know this. Look, because guess what? And why? You say, why, Pastor? Like, so you can protect against it. That's why. So you can protect against it. Look, you can't be damned as a saved believer. You can't be possessed by a demon as a saved believer because you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in you, but you can be tempted. You can be personally destroyed. You can have Satan and his demons pull you away from God. You know, Satan and his demons can destroy your relationships on this earth. This is why we preach so much. You know, why I preach so much, what the Bible says about relationships and marriage and children and families, because the devil can destroy all that for you, even though you're saved. He could pull you away from the spiritual things in your life and put you into the worldly things in your life if you allow it to happen. But you need to understand as you grow as a Christian, as you become somebody that is out there bearing fruit, the demons and Satan, their boss, want to stop that. They want to stop that fruit from coming to fruition. And they will do anything to stop you. You see, folks, Satan doesn't care about the Catholic. He doesn't care about the Mormon. He doesn't care about the unsaved soul today because he's already got them. He cares about you who are going to those people I just mentioned and trying to preach the gospel to them and pull them out of that darkness. That, that's what he cares about. That's what he cares about. I mean, every single Christian, every single Christian that has been knocked out of the Christian life by Satan will cost scores of souls. Look, you, you think about this. Think about how important this is and how big of a mission this is. You think about another soul winner coming into this church and another soul winner coming into this church and just doubling the size of this church of soul winners. You know, it's, look, it's a force multiplier for the gospel. We will get, if we have double the size of this church, we will get more people saved next year. If we double that, we will get more people saved. It's, just, it's a force multiplying equation. The same works backwards. One soul winner, you know, taken out of the Christian life will send scores and scores and scores and scores of people to hell. Because that's just, that there's not enough, because there's not enough of us to get the whole harvest. I, I've said it this way before, we're going to leave grain on the ground. We're going to leave grain on the ground, and if, that, if Satan and his demons can get to the Christians, we'll leave more on the ground. And that's what he's trying to do. You have to be, look, you have to be aware of this. You have to be aware of this. It's the fruit-bearing tree that he wants to burn. He's focused on you. Turn to Isaiah chapter 8. The more you grow, the more he will attack. But you know what? The more you grow, the more you should be filled with the Spirit, the more knowledgeable you should be. You should be able to recognize those attacks. You should be able to recognize when those things are happening. So look, keep that in mind, because the devil, the demon, he knew who Jesus was, but he also knows who you are. As far as people using his name, here's a simple methodology for you. When you finish your Bible reading, you're going to get to Revelation chapter 22, where basically I'll just summarize it for you. But this is how God ends the Bible. God ends the Bible. God ends the Bible by saying, hey, if anybody adds to my word or takes away from my word, I'm taking their, their name out of the book of life. Meaning, if you add to the Bible, if you add to my revelation or you take away from my revelation, it's like, you're going to go to hell. That's how God ends the Bible. You always wonder, like, the best book, how, what's, how's, that last, how's that last page? That's the last page. Like, you add or take away, meaning you change it in any way. So there's your extra revelation, folks. But look at Isaiah chapter 8 and verse number 20. Isaiah chapter 8 and verse number 20. That coupled with this should, should just 
answer anybody dropping the name of Jesus for you. To the law and to the testimony. What's the testimony? It's this right here. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Every single spectrum of those people name dropping Jesus from the social gospel, no doctrine person, all the way to the person claiming that they're Jesus, it's like there's, there's no light in those people. There's no light in them because they're speaking against what God's word says. All right? Keep that in mind. This is a super important story for us. It's, it's, it's something that we're going to see for our entire lives. People dropping the name of Jesus. And look, these demons and Satan himself is walking this earth. God is allowing it. God is allowing it for now. We, we must be aware of it. That's why he tells us these things in the Bible. He knows who Jesus is, and he knows who is saved. He knows who's working for Jesus. We have to keep that in mind. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.